Well, it is my uh, pleasure and a true honor to be gifted this opportunity to speak to you all today about the research I've worked on for the past six months. And I'd like to thank the board at OWASP for inviting me to tell you about it, for trusting me to tell you about it. So you can leave the session today with a little bit of updated knowledge about a set of, of uh, emerging threats of which we should all be aware. And now if you'll indulge me this early and so soon after you've had your morning uh, beverage, I'd like to open with, uh, with a visualization exercise. No need to close your eyes for this one. I would like for you to try and imagine for a moment that you're a regular Joe named Patrick. As a moderately successful science fiction author, you live a seemingly ordinary American life in Milwaukee, Wisconsin and you tend to enjoy the, th the simple things in life, right? You work on your deck on the weekends, you ride your bike on the open roads, and you spend evenings at your favorite local bar, uh, maybe engaging in discussions on politics or local sports teams. And uh, you're divorced, you've since remarried a really lovely woman with kind eyes named Nikki. And you share your home with a sweet white cat and the coolest bearded dragon. And you bought a duplex so you can live in one half and rent out the other side so you can help make ends meet. And I think so far I've described a life that many of us can relate to um, or even aspire to, right? It's comfortable, it's middle class, it's unremarkable, it's normal, right? Apple pie and baseball. Now I want to introduce a real life scenario that has transformed this conventional life into a perpetual nightmare. Imagine being stalked for five years by people you don't know and never did anything to. It starts online but quickly escalates. You receive thousands of abusive text messages. Social media platforms that you once used to freely share your ideas and keep in touch with family and friends now harbor hundreds of accounts created solely to disparage you. Tweeting anything now invites replies from tens of anonymous accounts accusing you of the most heinous crimes you can imagine. Um, grooming, pedophilia, of being a failed father, overweight, a worthless husband, right? Um, any projection they can think uh, to aim at you. And there's an obscure web forum with a few thousand users that happens to contain over 400,000 posts dissecting every aspect of your existence, from your professional accomplishments, or as the forum would claim lack thereof, to the most intimate details of your personal life. And all of these fabricated lies being pumped out about you have started to make the people around you, frankly, suspicious. You notice a lot of your friends have just stopped reaching out, and others have told you outright that they know that these attacks are false, but they simply cannot risk maintaining a relationship with you, an active relationship where they're seen with you out in public, um, right? For fear of being similarly targeted. They're, they're frightened. And it doesn't stop there. Someone scrawled a threat with a permanent marker on your motorcycle, which was parked at your house. Someone covertly took video of you walking into your home, which was later used to create a new Google Maps entry listing your home as a public business, complete with harassing and racist one-star reviews. Um, a large load of wood chips was ordered and parked behind your car, blocking you in. Someone tried to open dozens of financial accounts in your name, and the books that you write to try and make a living are mobbed with uh, more racist one-star reviews as soon as they're published. Your daughter, who's a minor, is targeted. Your author website is DDoSed. And your personal information, both real and fake, is published in many awful places, many of which you aren't even aware of. Some of the stalkers have started to impersonate real people, and they're reaching out to you. And it starts to take you some time just to deconflict. Are these real people? Are these uh, business opportunities? Is this a, an old friend? You know, um, It just takes some time to figure out that they aren't legitimate. Recordings of prank calls targeting you by someone possibly using a voice changer are posted on the forums, and you and your family are receiving death threats. You have no idea who these people are or why they're doing any of this. Many public records associated with you in your life have been posted online and sometimes modified with false information. You attend professional conferences with fellow authors 
supposed sanctuaries of like-minded individuals just like this one, only to later discover you were being filmed surreptitiously. The footage will be scrutinized, mocked, and later disseminated within hours to continue fueling the campaign against you. Business cards featuring a URL to a website made to harass you are plastered around conference venues, right? Somebody showed up, one or more people, and uh, went into the bathrooms and the hallways and dropped these little cards off with a domain name that is, you know, intended to harass me. And so, um, to harass you, you know, you, I can, I, I'm putting myself in the shoes of this individual and that's really what we're trying to do here, right? This visualization exercise is an empathy exercise. These conferences that you attend are being disrupted by bomb and death threats um, and even people who are only vaguely associated with you, such as another writer colleague of yours, uh, who on his way to the same sci-fi convention to accept an award was detained for five days by Homeland Security on his way into the US by, you know, from Nigeria due to a report that originated from the forums that was clearly targeting this author for his race. And the, the racial slurs they used to refer to this man are deeply disturbing. And the stalkers have even started to pretend to be you while using them. One of your stalkers who claimed publicly to other harassers to be a police officer, and coincidentally the same guy who made the false report to DHS, doxes your precise location and the venue's name and phone number exactly 11 minutes after you posted a harmless photo of yourself and your wife enjoying a drink together with little else visible in the photo, suggesting potential misuse of official resources. Right. And let's not forget the uh, Patti LaBelle concert in your city that made the news due to a bomb threat leading to evacuation on one of the same days that you were swatted. And swatting, what is that? What is swatting? It's the act of calling in a false report of a serious incident to the police, which often leads to a violent armed response. You know this. In fact, you've been hit with more than 40 swatting attempts. Your elderly parents were even swatted in the middle of the night. Through all of this, the police and federal law enforcement don't really seem to want to help you. You just can't find any service organization that will help you. Now imagine that you choose to do what many would recommend, which is to go the expensive route through the legal system because law enforcement just won't help. So you sue to try to obtain the identities of these harassers from the tech companies that help them stay online, but fail in court given various complexities, including Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, which meant you needed to prove that the administrator of the site was actually part of the harassment cult targeting you. You even tried to sue Cloudflare. Uh, it didn't work. You were trying to obtain the identities of your harassers. It didn't work. So now that your lawyers have failed to stop this harassment in court, you're now forced to pay your anonymous harassers legal bills in the, to the tune of tens of thousands of dollars. Even after they created a website with multiple domain names to economically terrorize you by claiming the admin of the forum would take your house if you refused to pay the judgment. Right, because the judgment was so big that you know it, it would be it would be your home as collateral. So they they willed this website, which is hosted on AWS, by the way, um, among others, like a joke meme to threaten and mock you, and you can't really stop it. Right, you feel like if you move to another place or you change your phone number, data brokers will just sell your data to your attackers. You register a new utilities, you connect your phone bill. And now that information is out amongst the data broker community and they're passing it around. The people who inexplicably hate you um, text you many times per day, sometimes hundreds of messages. And you look up the phone carriers online for each one of these phone numbers and you complain to them. But the tech companies keep ignoring your reports um, or saying that they're actually the only the wholesale vendors of these phone numbers that are being used to send you the death threats and that they can't do anything to stop anyone from messaging your phone number. Meanwhile, the attackers just change their number repeatedly to make sure that you get their messages. One message per number, so you can't block them, right? Blocking's not helpful. So your phone can actually only stop unknown numbers from reaching you if they're truly unknown, not simply missing from your contact book but identifiable to the device. So several of the forum members um, uh, actually physically showed up to your court hearing regarding enforcement of this judgment with seemingly little fear of arrest or repercussion, some from the main forum and some from another site called Kiwi Farms, 
which is a more prolific hate forum. This is actually far from the first time the strangers have traveled across state lines to try to come and find you and make you feel afraid. And you now have to stand in a court of law while one of the most prolific aggressors against you, who traveled a thousand miles away from his home to harass you in person, gives his name to the court recorder as required so he can stay and watch the proceedings. The video of you walking down the courtroom hallway and the documents obtained in person from the court file that day would be posted later that day for hundreds of laughs. In fact, a small number of YouTubers and podcasters who call themselves documentarians frequently attempt to make money and score reputation points off of this perverse spectacle, which is your life as a stalking victim, sensationalizing your daily torment into an ongoing drama series for their personal gain, often with um, you know, thousands or hundreds of thousands of followers. And these documentarians produce extensive conspiracy theories about you, such as claiming that you're lying about the attacks for attention. And then uh, they disseminate these conspiracies uh, freely to people who aren't in on the joke at all and begin to suspect you as a completely awful person in the absence of other information. And so as masters of gaslighting and projection, one of the most pervasive lies these awful people tell others about you is that you're somehow performing these swatting attacks, which you feel could get you killed at any moment on yourself, and that you purchase these attacks from a, from a vendor on Telegram. And some of them even use their real names and faces while doing all of this stuff. They say you deserve these attacks for being a public figure. You don't even know what that means, right? You're not a famous author. You're just a regular guy. You have 50,000 followers on Twitter, so maybe that makes other people feel like you're a big guy, but you feel like a regular guy. You live in a regular house. You're, you know, you're, you're, you're a regular person. So you, tr <clears throat> excuse me. So you try and obtain orders of protection or restraining orders against uh, one of these stalkers, right? I mean, he's a short, middle-aged, somehow gainfully employed uh, man living in the Boston area who's one of the most visible stalkers targeting you. And I say, you know, uh, short and middle age because he isn't um, someone who is physically imposing is the point, right? Um, but he travels and he's persistent and he's nasty and he says uh, scary things and you want to protect your wife, right? So you submit the request for the restraining order, it's rejected, you try again, rejected again. The first time you didn't have enough evidence, the second time you shouldn't have attached it, Perversely, there seems to be nothing uh, that you can do at all, despite the fact that this unstable individual has posted threats of violence against you using his real name, regularly contacts you in any available medium despite your constant attempts to stop it, and has traveled to your home multiple times. Like, the police won't arrest him and the FBI doesn't care. So everything I've just described to you is actually only a subset of attacks that have come your way. And here's the kicker, right? All of this irrational hate targets you an average person, a regular person who has done absolutely nothing to warrant such obsession and malice. I mean, you don't even fit the average profile of a person who's cyber stalked, do you? As cybersecurity experts, we're trained to analyze threats as data points, vulnerabilities to patch and risk to mitigate. But today we're here to examine a far less abstract threat that is so intricately woven into our digital world in a way that it's, it, you know, it's not a dystopian novel, it's not a thought experiment or some type of fictional scenario. It's a real relentless onslaught that's being experienced by a real person, an average citizen with very little recourse. Now I want you to consider the implications for security, both personal and systemic, if such a barrage of hatred were directed at you, a security expert. How would you safeguard your sanity? How would you safeguard your reputation? And how would you safeguard your very life in the face of such ceaseless and unwarranted hatred? What could you do to make it stop? How might your career be impacted? And what about your mental health? What would the people around you do, right? Your relatives, your friends, and your colleagues, would they understand the nature of the threat and keep close to lend you support? Or would they abandon you after the 50th public accusation of child abuse? Could you survive this type of security incident? Thank you so much for choosing to be here today. I am truly honored to be your keynote speaker. And I have just presented you this scenario not as a fiction, but as a real life horror story, which is still ongoing. 
And because we need to know what to do to stop this situation and prevent future occurrences, and the first step to solving a problem is recognizing it, examining its contours, and giving it a name, let us begin. In 2018, science fiction author Patrick Tomlinson posted a casual tweet. I simply said that I'd never personally found the comedian Norm Macdonald funny. It caught the attention of online harassers who began swatting Patrick and his wife Nikki at their Milwaukee home. Swatting is when false calls trick 911 dispatchers into sending an all-out armed response. The experience can be terrifying. I make my way downstairs to find that there are half a dozen uh, police with pistols drawn, shotguns, AR-15s, flashlights all pointed at my head. I am pulled out of the house and then on my own front porch I am immediately I'm handcuffed. And not just once. Our house has been swatted 42 times now. 42 times police have actually come in some form to your yes. door. Yes. No central agency tracks swatting, but one estimate put the number at more than 1,000 incidents in 2019 alone. Over just six days this April, at least nine universities were victims. And police estimate each incident costs communities more than $10,000. So, Patrick and Nikki are still constantly are harassed. Talking. They've been texting us yeah, during this interview. And their harassers use voice synthesizers and other technology to mask their identity. Maybe you should get a real job. Then again, you'll be able to learn a trade in prison. At the same time, they can't get the police to stop coming. The Milwaukee Police Department tells NBC News they have been to Patrick and Nikki's house at least 40 times, but they didn't share any ideas for how they're going to solve this problem. In a statement, they told us MPD has a duty to respond to calls for service in order to ensure that no one is in danger. How dangerous is swatting? It's extremely dangerous. Now, the FBI is getting involved, creating a swatting command center so police departments can exchange information. We know the problem exists throughout the country. I think the FBI recognizes that uh, we have uh, resources available to help track what's going on, to be able to easily share information with one another to report incidents. Meanwhile, Patrick and Nikki are in their fifth year of daily harassment. What has it done to the two of you to be in this position? It's taken away our sanctuary. We don't feel safe in our own home. Every department in this country should have policies, procedures, and training around it. People have died from it. There is no excuse. A waste of public resources and a nightmare for its victims. Jake Ward, NBC News, Milwaukee. All right. So if I could tell you the whole story from the beginning, it started earlier this year when I noticed some really weirdly aggressive trolls attacking someone on Twitter. And that someone happened to be Patrick Tomlinson. As an everyday Twitter user who is regularly attacked, I felt that the way these people were attacking him seemed so wildly out of line and bizarre, I assumed they had to be paid to be doing this work. And because I had been investigating geopolitical actors over the past few years, I reached for the first conclusion that seemed logical. And this is a clear example of analyst bias. My brain saw something that wasn't there. I immediately asked Patrick, why don't you just ignore them? In my previous experience with garden variety trolls, if you block and ignore them, they tend to go away. And he replied, it would be futile. He's tried. Huh? Uh, and actually, uh, let me go back. In 2018. Oh, 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 here we go. Let me go back here. So I decided to go into that obscure forum where these individuals were organizing and to run some recon about what was actually going on in there, right? And after spending some time looking through the forum and gathering information about its participants, I came to the realization that this truly was a harassment cult, just as the victim had described it. And it had all the key features of a distinct internet culture with its own uh, history, characters, language, in-jokes, memes focused on their targets, right? Social networks and distribution channels for content. And in fact, this harassment cult that had been uh, tormenting Patrick and gaining steam for several years um, had this forum as its uh, key social network, a self-hosted forum running on Zenforo uh, software. And what I found inside there was absolutely disgusting. It's a cesspool of awful deranged personas, right? Hate speech in every thread, racism of every stripe, anti-Semitism, anti-woman, anti-queer, anti-trans, anti-human. Literally anything awful you can think of has been represented there in explicit detail. And I will not disturb you with graphic visuals of their content. But as examples, they had a long thread of popular celebrity Lucy Lawless with swastikas photoshopped on her body. 
They um, had a Jew hate thread that they regularly bump to the top of the forum, which runs hundreds of pages. Um, I've seen them work AI transformations to turn photos of their targets into racist caricatures. And of course, 400,000 posts about their celebrity crush, Patrick Tomlinson. Despite these users being Nazis in all but name, my main problem with this place wasn't even the speech, right? It was that dangerous offline activity that we just saw, right, that had been fomented by this group of individuals had led me as an investigator towards that forum. And once I got there, I realized this was a potentially explosive situation given the recent addition of swatting attacks to the attacker's repertoire. The lack of clarity regarding who it was that was actually conducting these attacks and the total lack of interest from law enforcement. It seemed clear that these actors would continue to escalate, that there was no legitimate motive for their actions whatsoever, and that they were entirely driven by their own psychologies. And despite some previous media attention and legal assistance in Patrick's case, it seemed like nothing could be done. So I decided to take the fight directly to the trolls. You see, I had uh, learned a really useful technique by observing some of my friends who were heavily targeted for their political work over the years. And this technique I found useful involves poking a threat until something interesting comes out. Essentially fuzzing uh, another human being who appears to be acting in a malicious manner. And so I posted to the forum and decided to directly threaten them with doxing or removing their anonymity. And as expected, this produced an immediate flurry of activity and useful data. One troll immediately doxed me and posted tons of my PII and that of other people with similar names to mine. A photograph of me in a partial state of undress that my girlfriend took when we were both 14 years old was hacked off of a Linux box I used to learn how to admin a community shell server when I was 15 years old. That photo was used to target me for years on hacker socials. I laughed it off because I don't really see it as a big deal, but it's definitely illegal to possess, and it's disgusting to harass somebody with this kind of content, right? And this photo, which I don't recall even personally seeing myself in the last two decades, somehow immediately ended up on this forum. Right? Um, I complained to Cloudflare, who protects the forum with security services, which obscure the server's ultimate IP address. And they forwarded my complaint to their customers per their policy, who would be the admin of the server, which has a paid account with Cloudflare. The image was removed pretty rapidly by the administrator, who clearly sensed legal risk. However, all those docs, right, a dossier of your personal information, all of that stayed up. And in fact, there were hundreds of posts on the forum just with Patrick's home address in them. If you just go to the forum and search for, you know, the first four numbers um, and the street number, or the street name of uh, Patrick's home, it's pages and pages and pages of posts. It's odd, isn't it? And so I ran some quick OSINT and I posted the resume of the troll who doxed me. And he immediately direct messaged me on the forum and begged me to take it down. I attempted to negotiate, but he didn't appear to be in a position to do so. Right? So he freaked out, he bid his fellow forum users adieu, changed his username to guest in an attempt to avoid detection, which is funny because he was the only guest on the forum. And this told me that he didn't have the access needed to make the removal of any uh, forum post himself in order to truly delete his own account. And uh, you know, by the way, Something I found really interesting during this research was the finding that the more technically proficient of these individuals tend to identify themselves with handles in a similar manner as hackers do. A characteristic common to anonymous criminal ecosystems is the need to maintain some type of identifiable consistency in order to maintain their community status and reputation. Because ultimately, it's a large component of why they do what they do is community status and reputation, you know, ego. And so once I had toyed with these guys for a bit, I posted a screenshot that allowed them to identify my user account and block it, while I continued to use another account to access and monitor their captured forum. And making such a mistake caused the attackers to become very convinced of their own superiority against my ineptitude, which was a position that served me very well over the coming weeks as I poked and prodded for information. The registration capture I mentioned was non-obvious, and you had to know their memes to register an account. And they were so perplexed as to how I obtained this information, because let's just say the people who end up in these forums aren't exactly the brightest bulbs. And so it became clear to me that there was a Pareto principle-like distribution at play. I was guessing that maybe 80% of the actors were engaging in casual consumption of harassment-related content, and that a further 15% would be the most loyal and focused out of this group, and then maybe a 5% there would have a more direct involvement with the management and operation. 
But in reality, I was off on these numbers by just a little bit. I think in reality, the numbers are more like 90% of the actors engaging in casual consumption, and 7% engaging in highly loyal and regular consumption, and then 1% to 3% of the actors actively producing content, managing structures, and driving the group strategy. And so this means that deplatforming these actors at the infrastructure level is likely the most effective strategy for demobilizing their movement. But this also requires agreement amongst tech companies that we all work for, that this is a class and category of threat intelligence that is worth collecting and maintaining in order to protect user populations. I, uh, I want to mention that in the 60s and 70s, serial killers were quite prolific. And today, criminologists now estimate conservatively that the number of operating serial killers is in the range of 25 to 50 in the United States. And the theory that is being put forth by some folks is that easy access to semi-automatic rifles and mass shootings are now becoming the solution of choice to manage violent impulses which may have been previously expressed through serial killing. And so I think it's really important to think about the confluence of people who have very serious psychological problems, right, such as psychopaths, which are currently estimated as 1% of the population, and the internet, which now provides these types of people more power. And it's distributed power, right, because tech is power, and access to internet equals capability to scale. So I think it's entirely reasonable to theorize that the 1% to 3% I mentioned earlier correlates somewhat with the percentage of the population who have serious personality problems, such as antisocial personality disorder, which is correlated strongly with psychopathy. And those individuals are using our systems and are absolutely a part of our user populations. I want you to sit with that just for a moment while I wet my whistle. So now that you've stepped into the victim's shoes and now a little bit, know a little bit more about how I got into this, let's talk about the big picture for today in three pieces. Right. Um, and actually, before I talk about the three pieces, this is, a, this is a terminology that I coined. And I based it off of um, a, a term that is used to describe legal actions, uh, harassment actions that are taken against uh, journalists in particular. Right? Those are called slap cases, strategic legal attacks against public participation, because the goal is to stop journalists from writing about uh, particular issues. And so with this uh, um, terminology that I've coined here, what I'm trying to convey is the goal of some people in the way that they attack you is to get you to stop talking about things, to get you to stop participating in public life. And here's a graph showing what the SWAT attacks look like per month, just kind of a very basic uh, data chart that gives you a sense of um, what started happening here when I got involved. I was involved in what month, can you guess? This was the month that the attackers were the angriest. I became involved in April. And um, this caused a spike in the attacks and then a sharp drop off as the attackers started to realize that I was bringing more heat than they were truly interested in. But it shouldn't take somebody like me um, shouting every day for six months to produce some type of a change in this person's situation. It shouldn't take uh, me threatening a swatter you know, with arrest, having to do uh, all this complicated reporting and uh, daily work pro bono to get this to stop. And the, this guy, Patrick, is, he's just a microcosm. This is happening in a lot of other places. And most of the people who are targeted don't look like Patrick. These are marginalized identities, right? People who are already um, minorities, who are already targeted for some other reason. And I do want to go back to that statistic about psychopathy, right, and uh, psychopathic traits. There's a psychologist, Dr. Nuccitelli, in um, and he's, he's a New York based actually. I put New Jersey, but he's in New York. Um, I think he lives in one and maybe works in the other. But he's defined these frameworks that I think are incredibly helpful and useful because he treats people that have these traits and he helps victims uh, of people who have been targeted by these individuals. So the three big picture things that I want us to think about today are, uh, first of all, a new type of threat actor has emerged. These uh, actors have amassed into a small number of ugly corners on the internet, supported largely by bulletproof hosting providers and lack of social media moderation. 
right? Uh, these unmoderated anonymous spaces are hubs of hate crimes, harassment, doxing, and swatting. These spaces are primarily populated by military-age males who reinforce e each other in toxic subcultures which would be offensive to anyone with a functional sense of morality, right, as I described to you earlier. These are extremists with no particular unifying ideology that are operating primarily on the internet who are socially or better put psychologically motivated and for that reason are distinct from previous adversaries that we commonly defend against and therefore I will present some contextual information to help us understand their distinct motives. Big picture number two is that, you know, as InfoSec pros, we often manage on, folk, on uh, managing threats that have a financial motive, a political motive as in state sponsorship, or some ideological motive as in hacktivism. But the second thing I want us to discuss is how to actually define these individuals as a new type of threat actor whose motivations are primarily psychological in nature and whose behaviors don't align with other cyber criminals, right? So I will share some profiling uh, frameworks and details to help other pros more readily identify actors like these in their own environments. And then thirdly, I have some original research that I'd like to share uh, for the first time today, not in, uh, in uh, true detail, but in a way that would allow you to run your own verification if you are interested, if you're you know, an open source uh, uh, intelligence uh, wonk and like Googling things. And, and that research points directly towards state sponsorship of these types of trolls and actors more generally. And so it's important for us to understand how hate forums are able to stay online despite widespread opposition to their existence. So I want us to consider larger geopolitical implications and risks associated with these issues. So that was the, that was the uh, slide that I didn't advance to, right? So geopolitical and legal gaps. But before I get into it, you know, at this point you must be wondering how it is that I have the willpower and the capacity to engage in such counterattacks. Is anybody wondering this? Hold up your hand if you're wondering how in the heck I am doing this. <laughs> uh, I get that a lot. Uh, so I'm an Army vet who enlisted at age 17. I first went to Iraq at age 18. I spent many years overseas in Iraq and later Africa as a contractor for the Defense Department in a cleared capacity. And these were jobs in which I worked 12-hour days minimum, right, seven days a week. And of course my job was done in an active combat zone. So I and my colleagues worked through rocket attacks and all the other challenges involved with living uh, in an austere country and, and being engaged in warfare. So I maintained a stressful schedule and did a variety of things, which you could say has given me a particular set of skills. <laughs> so prior to those early professional experiences, I started in tech through the world of hacking, 2600 magazine and internet relay chat, like many of you. Uh, I started attending Linux users groups in person at age 14, and I then became a regular at 2600 meetings in Florida, and then later um, at the Citicorp building in New York City, where I was originally from. And during this time, I hung out in tons of IRC channels and was regularly attacked online by boys and men uh, with the most like, misogynist and racist invective. Like, it's just normal, right? This is a normal part of life for me as a teenage uh, female hacker in the late 90s and the early aughts. And there were, there were very few other females. There were even less girls of color in any room that I walked into, whether digital or in real life. And I was the only one who looked like me. And this was a time when we weren't even talking about that. Right. So my comment here is, you know, not to try this at home, because I'm, I'm a little odd, I'm an odd duck. I chose to drop out of high school in favor of spending time in these technical places that were available for me to learn, and I took the opportunity. Similarly to how I entered the attacker's environment in this case that I'm describing today in order to engage them directly and obtain the threat data that I wanted, and so I want to thank Many of the adults who tolerated me in their presence during that time, but not all of them were safe for a child to be around. I've developed a pretty you know, tough skin and a pretty good ability to defend myself uh, physically and mentally because I had to survive right in these hostile environments that I chose for myself. But another reason that I'm able to do this work is because my nervous system was even further desensitized due to the disinfo attacks that were targeting me personally that I experienced during the 2020 election in which I worked as the lead incident responder and threat analyst for the Biden-Harris campaign. And um, I was the second hire after the CISO who brought me on board in July. I made a calculated public announcement after joining the campaign, uh, after careful consideration and discussion with my boss, after all the work that you have to do in order to make sure that you're you know, 
uh, technically defensively prepared. Uh, I didn't actually anticipate all the other types of attacks that aren't the types of attacks that we normally receive as InfoSec professionals doing our jobs, right? So that announcement of mine led to attacks from known and unknown entities who contacted the campaign, my employer. They made fraudulent allegations about me. They tried to get me fired. And then they moved on to attempting to make the allegations stick by publishing anonymous claims in a far-right tabloid. These disinfo attacks were not successful in destabilizing the campaign or negatively affecting the campaign's security posture, but these were certainly the goals of this effort, right? Essentially, the core of these allegations was that, was that I was friends with a white supremacist who was previously a celebrity in InfoSec and activist circles due to a legal case against him where prosecutors alleged he violated the law. Large organizations like the EFF supported him, and so did many hackers and InfoSec pros, due to the perceived injustice of his prosecution. And at the time, his far-right inclinations were not widely known. The implication was that I was a closet white supremacist, despite my years of work to champion various progressive causes of anti-sexism and anti-racism in the security community. And many people didn't know me then, which is why the attack was effective. It provided a narrative before I had advanced one myself. So it's similar to what happens with Patrick, right? Um, Patrick posts something on Twitter, the trolls, reply. If he has them blocked, he won't see the replies. They can't reply to him, so they reply to other people who are trying to talk to him. And then other people get ensnared in that, right? They show up on the thread and they see these comments and they're like, oh my god, this guy, he's a, he's a child abuser. Oh my god, what did he do? Right? They throw crazy claims in there and because there was no narrative provided, and that was the first narrative that you were exposed to about Patrick Tomlinson, you're very likely to believe it. The first narrative is, is uh, pretty sticky. And so it, it's also notable to say that the individual that I was supposedly linked to was previously written about in an Atlantic Council report in conjunction with another disinformation actor uh, relating to a hack and leak operation in France that targeted the president of France called Macron Leaks. And this was another case of election interference. So you know, my job was to continue doing my work to keep the campaign safe, and so I did. Anonymous trolls like to claim that I was fired, but in fact, I was able to continue doing my job throughout the election, through the election, and uh, I'm really grateful for that. Staring that kind of pressure in the face was incredibly difficult, but I would do it again willingly. The mission was totally worth it, don't you agree? Right? Huge pressure, super worth it. Um, but it's extremely difficult to run your own incident response and I don't recommend it to anyone because that's how you end up ugly crying on Zoom with HR. <laughs> All of this is to say the best risk handling mechanism for suspected dangerous entities is avoiding engagement. Again, don't try this at home, right? If um, you know, people come after you, I actually see a couple of people in this audience who have already been targeted just for their tweets interacting with me. Um, you know, block them and move on. Just try your best not to um, arouse their ire because it can be really hard to get them to disengage once they've engaged. Mm. So this is a, a dense slide. I have uh, just a few dense slides in here that I don't want to uh, read off of and that you all can take a look at later. But what I'd like to do is uh, propose, I propose classifying psychologically motivated internet-based extremists as a distinct category of threat actor in our realm of InfoSec. Because this group remains largely under-recognized and seldom incorporated into prevailing threat models, um, I think it's really important that we start thinking about it, right? What, what sets them apart from others is their primary drive, their personal psychological desires, which contrast behind, uh, with the more commonly recognized motivations behind abusive tech systems as, we, as we've uh, discussed, right? Financial, political, ideological. And these motivations shape how systems are designed and, and the challenges that operators face when confronting these threats. Um, and as I've said, the methods employed are predominantly centered on disinfo campaigns, right? The attack signatures vary very much. They're influenced by their individual uh, psychologies. Um, and what's interesting about it is that the most motivated and persistent actors tend to yield the most data, which can be instrumental in developing unique attack signatures. So if you have really persistent um, individuals of this type, the more data that they give you, um, that is unique, that gives you information about their unique psychology, right? So for example, if they, 
if they call Domino's Pizza and they send you a pizza, right, as a prank, okay, that's an MO, that's a TTP, that's like a modus operandi. But if they put a harassing message that calls out your weight in the message, that then ends up on the receipt that you see, and that's uh, you know the kind of message they normally send. And that's a bit of an attack signature, isn't it? Right. So something very specific that they think about in their head that has an ideology that did not originate with you has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with them. So concerning Patrick, right? This is a, a uh, situation that exemplifies organ organized uh, stalking, and the strategy bears similarities to covert influence operations on social media. Right, because there are indications of accounts either collaborating secretly to, pro to propagate specific negative narratives or they're possibly being managed by a single individual. Right? Without being at the tech companies themselves or without being able to see that data, we don't actually know uh, who they are. We just try to separate them and that creates an analysis of variance problem. Right? You've got to try to take uh, thousands of people on a forum that are anonymous and you want to de-anonymize them, how do you do that? You've got to start looking at what they say, how they say it, right? What are the linguistic forensics there, right? But again, an analysis of variance problem. I'm distinguishing people from each other, which becomes even more difficult when they all share the same memes. They're very much in an insular community where they're talking about the same things every day. So it's a, it's a difficult problem, but I think with AI, we could probably make some inroads there. In InfoSec, it seems rare that we're able to obtain attribution so clearly because medium to high sophistication cyber actors are generally uh, interested and knowledgeable enough to think through data leakage and other detection related hygiene. But in this case, and with these types of actors, you know, their, their low to medium level of sophistication generally prevents them from understanding the nuances that go into operating online in a stealthy uh, anti-forensics manner, which limits their ability to evade detection. So really any individual who has a bit of uh, open source intelligence research background and a little bit of cyber skills uh, could do what I have done in order to identify these individuals, right? Attribution's not hard, that's what I'm getting at here. But it does require a willingness to engage. My repeated shouts on Twitter implying that the Milwaukee PD would soon murder this man <laughs> through their own incompetence and inaction caused the swatting attacks to stop having impact on the victim. Once my tweet received about 50,000 views, they, they started leaving notes in his mailbox as opposed to waking him and his family up every time they received a fraudulent call about him as opposed to showing up with guns blazing, bringing him out on his lawn, the whole shebang. And I then worked closely with NBC on that big piece that you watched earlier, which eventually made it up to national television on the show Morning Joe. So I want to claim a really small credit for the, for the fact that the FBI has now established a central tracking capability for swatting, which was long overdue. Um, but I'm sure that the topic uh, was simply an idea whose time has come. Because as you saw, you know, the ADL was quoted um, just in that uh, segment as uh, talking about the rise of swatting attacks. Because these are um, MOs or TTPs that are being shared in these toxic online communities. How do you find out about how to do these things to other people? How do you find out about what works? So you share it with your buddies. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I just want to say I'm really grateful to NBC for making that case be known nationally, right? Um, I also wrote several articles for my blog about other actors that we don't have time to discuss today, including the swatter, who was operating a service on Telegram and was targeting Patrick for pay. So today I'd like to play a couple of audio recordings that the swatter posted for me in his Telegram group. And uh, we'll, we'll skip past this because it is, again, a dense slide. You can take a look at this information a little bit later. Do you think you are so correct that there is a 0% possibility of you being wrong? I mean, seriously. What if I do something to every Jackie scene in the United States to prove that someone with the same name doesn't equal someone with the uh, same person behind that same identity? And you know what? You should probably have better evidence before you go out accusing random people of being me, you know. I'm, I'm not Dushatar. I mean, I don't think you give a fuck about an innocent white man 
being fucked over considering your ethnicity and that really sucks and you know what you can arrest the shatar you can you can try to do whatever you want with the swedish guy and um as for me i do have an ar-15 at home and a clock 17 that the boot i got illegally so you gotta contend with that so vice magazine publishes an article uh saying that there's a telegram group that's selling swattings and so i went in and did some research that day and found all these references to patrick tomlinson Imagine my confusion, right? It couldn't be the case that all of the attacks that are coming towards Patrick are being purchased through Telegram, right? It couldn't be. But it seems like that is what was happening. And when I did the research into this individual and wrote the blog post exposing them, um, they reacted in this way. And as you can see, there isn't a logic you know what I mean? There isn't a logic to this stuff. They, they, even, they confuse their inner personality and their inner identity with their external identity, du they, 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 There's just a, there's a lack of coherence to the things that these people say that is um, kind of disturbing, right? And then he gets to the point where he says, well, if it doesn't work that I've intimidated her, I've got to mention my guns <laughs> that I've obtained illegally. The next thing I want to discuss is the work of New York-based psychologist Dr. Nuccitelli. Dr. Nuccitelli has treated and developed diagnostic criteria for these people that he terms i protopaths and he's developed some other frameworks that I think are useful to help us think about these threats. For example, the troll triad here perfectly describes the three individuals who I found to be operating at the top of the pyramid, so to speak, uh, the people who are most engaged in the harassment cult that drive its culture and behaviors and manage the operations, they manage the systems that keep the thing up and running. And um, the, the engagement here is in character, defamation, slander, and libel. This is just like updated technology uh, focused groups of people who are disturbed, who somehow form this troll triad, which makes them extremely effective in what they do. This individual is the admin of the forum. I gotta say, when I found this uh, framework, I was completely blown away because after spending so much time being attacked by these people and learning about them and studying them, I was mind blown to see something that described them in such clarity. Um, this person is the architect, this person is the legitimacy front, uh, and, and this describes them to a T. They do not display anger or rage in public settings. They try to keep themselves really controlled. There is a provocateur. This individual is running YouTube infrastructure, right? He's like a podcaster. He wants to be a content creator, but he's actually a propagandist, a disinformation producer. And his goal is to motivate other people to engage in the harassment, to produce content that allows them to stick. This person loves unverified claims. It's just anything they can say. And because they are a relatively charming type of psychopath who is gainfully employed, um, you know, looks like a normal person by day, they fool a large number of people. They, there's, a, there's a type of legitimacy that they create by using their real name and face and going onto YouTube and saying, look at this guy, Patrick, you know, and, and this guy has published 60 videos, right? This is an entire cottage industry for him, um, regardless of whether he makes money on it or not. In fact, I think it actually drains his wallet. He spends a lot of money to fly across the country to harass, to obtain private data, um, all that kind of stuff. And then we have the crier. The crier, um, this person is uh, another disinfo actor. You know, really these three all, just all work together in order to lie. And it's incredible how pernicious lies have become in the world, isn't it? We talk about them every day now. The question of how these actors continue to operate, despite the widespread opposition to their toxic cultures, isn't simple. 
The reality is that there are complex networks of obscured financial and technical support uh, that help keep these forums online, to help keep these uh, people talking to each other. And it's important to note that these actors seek the internet venues that are the least restrictive on their speech, right? Which is why Elon Musk's Twitter has turned into the cesspool that it has now that there is no more moderation um, on the platform or very little moderation um, or simply that the policies have changed, right? And so I found a piece of evidence that showed that the, oop, what happened? Oh, here we go. Um, I found a piece of evidence showing that the uh, administrator of the forum targeting Patrick had previously years ago declared his intention to move the site to Russia to avoid restrictions on hate speech. So I wanted to make sure to show that to you today. Right? This person clearly understood, right? and, I, and I blurred out some slurs here because why repost them, but this person clearly understood that in order to evade the hate speech restrictions of the US and the EU, he needed to move specifically to Russia. And so I was really interested in uh, following this connection. Um, and so at a certain point, I was given a bit of information from a tipster who ran a de-anonymizing application cheekily called Crimeflare against the infrastructure of this forum, which revealed its actual host despite their use of Cloudflare as a bulletproof hosting provider. Bulletproof providers are those that are um, resistant to requests to take down content such as hate speech. And I think Cloudflare themselves would uh, very much resist the label of being a bulletproof hosting provider, but there isn't really any other way to describe them today. I have a blog post about uh, Cloudflare uh, that I suggest you take a look at if you're further interested there. But I was uh, further able to validate that tip that came in when the operator of the site made a momentary mistake in their Cloudflare config allowing me to identify the actual ASN or network block associated with hosting the site. I was able to view this via Hurricane Electric's website. They publish observable global network events. And what I found associated with that ASN was a series of British shell companies. Unlike traditional corporations that engage in legitimate commerce, employ staff, and pay taxes, shell companies are often just vessels for holding assets and conducting financial transactions, right? They're not illegal, per se. But the secrecy they offer can be a really potent tool for bad actors who are wishing to create and dissolve legal structures, corporate legal structures, without exposing their own identity, enabling them to open financial accounts and move money across the globe. If you all heard uh, something about the Panama Papers, that's what that was about, right? The US and the UK and the British Virgin Islands are all examples of locales known for their very permissive environments, which has made these entities vehicles of choice for illicit activities from money laundering to fraud. The first of these UK shell companies that I found to be associated with that ASN uh, was immediately used to register a block of more than 700,000 IP addresses. That's a big chunk, right? That's a big old chunk. And then a year later, that massive block of IPs was further divided amongst a set of three additional new shell companies, all with similarly suggestive yet somewhat generic names. Lots of bits limited, speedy bits, right? And when I looked into who had registered these entities in the United Kingdom, I found an individual who represented themselves to the British government as a Canadian citizen and as a systems analyst or programmer. And there is a corresponding uh, British Virgin Islands entity with the same name, which potentially assists with moving funds in a manner that is untraceable to its ultimate beneficial owner. Because that's one of the key things about a shell company is understanding who the beneficial owner is, who are the ultimate people who are benefiting from the money that's flowing through, who are the ultimate um, people that uh, uh, benefit from that organization. Um, with the British Virgin Islands, you can't get that information readily, it's hidden. Um, there are many states uh, in the United States where that's also a thing. For example, Wyoming. Um, in Canada, the owner of these shell companies uses entirely different first names and represents themselves entirely differently as a PhD level humanities student, um, a poet with no other interests. And it almost seemed unlikely that they were the same person, but for one important detail, um, this student speaks Chinese and they had described tutoring Chinese students in the computer science department on technical writing. Uh, which is a complete departure from the rest of their resume. Just follow me here, okay? This person publishes poetry and has a particularly whimsical YouTube video where they describe being a stranger in a strange land, fooling others, and living a life that isn't their own. The faces of both individuals using the, the same last name but different first names is the same. 
I found a single photo of a person whose face and mannerism also are a close match to those individuals, and that photo was found on a V-Contact profile, which is Russia's version of LinkedIn. Through this Canadian technical intermediary, which manages the network, the UK shell companies are used to register and, ma and manage massive chunks of internet territory in order to enable routing traffic to Russia, which is not identifiable as such because they use those foreign shell companies to register those blocks of IPs, um, which had actually been transferred from Hostkey Russia, a Russian ISP, the day after the company was registered, which uh, is a timing that indicates planning. Internet space has a lot of hidey holes and odd paths, but the, you know, the internet is very resilient by design, and part of that includes the ability to engage in peering relationships. And those peering relationships between ASNs are what create the routing, right, the paths that allow all of us to talk to each other across the world. And so um, they can provide added information about the real world relationships between entities that are working together to route traffic. And so as I grew intrigued about the connections of far-right trolls to Russia, I wanted to investigate further, and so I started looking into DNS records associated with Kiwi Farms, a prolific hate site that has had a lot of difficulty staying up due to the continued efforts of brave activists to deplatform them. And what I found absolutely shocked me. Um, an ASN which hosted Kiwi Farms for seven months, all visible in DNS records, all searchable by y'all in this room, uh, was clearly associated with Metcom Bank, a Russian bank closely associated with oligarch Victor Vexelberg. And when I dug further, I came to realize that it was Kiwi Farms web host itself, Epic, E-P-I-K, which had a direct relationship, as the DNS servers for Epic were also using IP addresses associated with the Metcom Bank ASN. This vital, previously unreported metadata links a Putin-friendly oligarch to U.S. tech company and notorious far-right hoster Epic, which suggests that they might receive support from the Russian government through international intermediaries. And the situation isn't just about isolated groups, but appears to be well-organized, uh, financially-backed operations with multifaceted operations. Right? These goals include nurturing actors capable of sowing discord in the West and expanding Russia's online influence by establishing concealed network routes. These routes facilitate traffic between the sanctioned West and Russia, which is realized with the assistance of technical intermediaries in various countries, preventing all of us InfoSec folk from detecting systems hosted on those networks as being associated with Russia. It looks like it's in the British Virgin Islands. It looks like it's in Portugal. But it's actually being paid um, by the Kremlin. And one such intermediary is Epic, uh, a domain registrar and web hosting provider known for servicing websites with far-right, neo-Nazi, and extremist content. And as mainstream services become much more resistant to hosting such sites in the wake of mass shootings that seem to have originated on social media, um, you know, Epic has turned into a preferred choice, right? They're, they're indirectly, indirectly, maybe directly, I don't think I wrote that correctly, they're, they're directly nurturing environments that are conducive to extremism. Right? Uh, notable platforms like 8chan that are associated with white supremacist attacks, uh, Parler, which is linked to the Capitol riot on January 6, 2021, and groups um, and individuals, suspicious individuals like Michael Flynn, um, a convicted electors uh, plot uh, uh, criminal Sidney Powell, Alex Jones, um, the Oath Keepers, the Proud Boys, and many more. So given Russia's recent and historical belligerence, as well as its implicit support of ransomware groups that regularly extort U.S. organizations, and I want people to start considering ransomware to be a harassment technique, right? Ransomware as harassment at scale. Um, this creates pathways that Kremlin actors can exploit to activate these vulnerable individuals during wartime who further expose themselves to extortion by generating leverage material or compromise right, by being in these, uh, in these social networks and in these places, right? So the Kremlin's implicit support for bad actors in cyber is quite similar to their provision of implicit support for low-grade cyber terror through the bulletproof hosting of hate forums. All right, so we're, we're uh, just about out of time. But the point I want to talk about, the point I want to make here is that the underlying motive for this support is destabilization, right? All of these places, all of these hubs of hatred are, are places that we really need to disinfect. We need to shine the light. We need to talk about these things more and more. We need to incorporate these people into our threat models. Um, there are many more relevant details involved here for people who follow politics. I plan to publish a blog post all about it. Um, I wanted to wrap with some solutions, but I've taken too long. 
And um, I, what I'm going to do is update these slides with the information that I didn't get to today, and I will repost that for everybody here so that you can get the details that I missed. But I thank you so much for being here today and um, listening to this. Thank you so much.